So thanks very much for the introduction. Um, again, I'm Brad Chamberlain. I'm the technical lead of the Chapel Project here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And this is part of an annual tradition at CHU where we give an update on the state of the project, kind of recapping events since the previous year. So to start out, if you are here and somehow uh, don't know what Chapel is, or if you're watching this online after the fact, Chapel is a modern parallel programming language. It's designed for parallelism from the start, and it's also designed to be portable and scalable. So we're very happy that Chapel runs on laptops, desktops, um, clusters, the cloud, and of course, supercomputers from HPE and other vendors. Chapel is an open source project. Uh, it's developed at GitHub and it's collaborative. We collaborate under the Apache 2.0 license, which is a fairly permissive license if you're not familiar with it. At the highest level, you can think of Chapel as having two main goals. The first one is to support general parallel programming. And you can think of this as if you have any parallel algorithm in your mind that you'd like to implement and some parallel hardware you'd like to run that on, you ought to be able to do that in Chapel. And if not, we're failing at this goal. And then the second goal is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. And one way you can think about this is we'd like the kind of support that people sort of like Python is most often cited as, as an influence that has good support for rapid prototyping and for supporting code that's very clear to read and to write. But where Python isn't known for performance and scalability, we want to get the performance and scalability and GPU support of things like Fortran, C, C++, MPI, OpenMP, CUDA, and the like. So the kinds of things that people use for high performance computing to get scalability and performance today. All right, so the best of both worlds there is the goal. Now I'm not gonna have time to tell you very much about the Chapel language itself, but again, if you're not familiar with it, um, this slide talks about how for HPC benchmarks, Chapel tends to be concise, clear, and competitive. So on the left here, I've got some reference versions of some benchmarks written in C and MPI, and in the first case, OpenMP. In the middle column, I've got the Chapel equivalents of those codes uh, shown on the left. And on the right, I have some performance graphs that show that Chapel competes with, or in the second case beats the reference version, um, showing that despite being shorter, clearer, cleaner code, uh, you can also get good performance out of it. Now, if all we could do was get good benchmark results, that would be nice and notable. Um, but of course, the real test of any language is the degree to which it's being used for applications or not. And so happily, we do have a handful of flagship Chapel applications today. And I'll be coming back and talking about a few of these more a little bit later in the talk. And also you'll be hearing from many of these groups today. So I'm not gonna spend more time here for now. All right, I also wanna call out the Chapel team. At HPE, we currently have 16 full-time employees, three summer interns and, interns and our director. Um, we also have one more full-time engineer joining this month and a few open positions where our sort of uh, target headcount is 19 to 20, generally speaking. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about the team or those open positions, there are links at the bottom of this slide. Um, and then since the last time we saw you at CHU 2021, we've done three main releases. Um, Chapel 125 was released in September of last year. Uh, we did a release 125.1 to update some things in December. And then uh, in March, we've done Chapel 126. Um, our next release looking forward is Chapel 127. That's gonna be coming out at the end of this month. And as you can kind of tell, we're, we're picking up our release pace a bit here. Um, our, our expectation, our plan, is to release on a quarterly schedule from this point forward. Uh, and we'll see if we can manage to keep up with that. So this June release will be our first sort of intended quarterly release on that new schedule. Uh, so again, this project, uh, sorry, this talk is about the state of the Chapel project. And if I had to summarize it in just a single word, I would say that it, it's going really, really well. It's fantastic. Um, I think we've had a really strong year and I'm gonna tell you a bit about that in the time that I have remaining. And what I've done is I've kind of just looked through notes and public announcements and things like that and ended up with 10 highlighted areas or efforts since last year's CHU that I want to call out very briefly. Uh, this will be a little bit fast and furious, uh, but bear with me. Hopefully it'll get you energized for the rest of the day. So the very first thing I wanted to call out was new faces. When you run a workshop like this for a while, uh, as Engen mentioned, this is our ninth instance of the workshop. You know, you see some people come back and that's obviously great. Uh, but you always wonder, like, are we going to get new people? And we're really happy this year to get a number of submissions from new groups and new individuals. And in some cases, things that we hadn't anticipated receiving, which I think is a great sign of growth for the workshop. And so I wanted to call out uh, those uh, groups and individuals who haven't spoken at CHU before. Uh, and to thank you for participating in CHU this year and submitting your work to it and talking to us about it a little bit later today. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole list. 
Engen showed you how to find the program online, so you can read more about these online if you're interested. Uh, but again, thanks to those of you listed here who submitted this year. The second thing I want to talk about is a little bit dry and hopefully the kind of thing that most of the time you don't notice. That's compiler improvements since last year. And there are kind of two main things I want to call out here. The first one is we've undertaken in the last year a, a new and significant effort that we call Dino. Uh, the term comes from rock climbing, a dynamic move that moves you across the rock's face. And the background here is that if you've, if you've used Chapel at all, you probably know that it's got some drawbacks. It can be slow, and maybe the first time you compile it doesn't bother you so much, but if you're compiling a lot, that can really start to weigh you down. Um, sometimes it can be hard to understand, particularly when there are errors in the user code. Um, and if you look at the internals, it's not terribly well architected. Uh, it's a little bit inflexible. It's challenging to get started with as a new developer. And I would say that all of these factors largely reflect the fact that this is a project that at its start, was kind of a scrappy small research project. We were a very small team. We we're trying to move very fast to stay alive. And unfortunately, we're still carrying a lot of the baggage that was sort of uh, implemented at that time, which may have been appropriate at the time, but has weighed us down as time has gone on. So this dino effort is essentially an effort to go back and address these problems, essentially massively re-architecting the compiler in place to get a better user experience, to make it easier to start contributing to the code base, and to make the compiler faster and more flexible. So supporting things like separate compilation, dynamically evaluating code, and other things you might want from a modern compiler. Now the status, um, this is still a fairly new effort, but in our release at the end of this month, the Dino parser, the new parser, and, and the new AST that it uses will become the default for the very front end uh, in this month's release. We also have some rewrites and restructurings of later passes that are well underway. Some of those will be online and used in this release, and others will be coming out in future releases. And we've also been doing a much better job as we go of documenting the code structure than we did in the past. And so um, there's Doxygen docs that are generated online, and I've got a link here and a little bit of a screenshot of what that looks like. So this is a new effort, very exciting, uh, but it'll be a while before you see the fruits of it uh, appearing and benefiting you in the end, as an end user. The second one also we hope you won't notice. Uh, we've traditionally used uh, C as our back end. So we've generated C code as our portable assembly, uh, and there's been an option to also use LLVM as the backend, but that hasn't been the default. And for a long time, we've intended to change that, and we finally did so in Chapel 125. So today, the LLVM compiler is the preferred and default backend compiler, although the C-based compilation is still available as an option. And there are a bunch of reasons that we did this. Let me just call out a couple. One is that we put in a lot of effort trying to support all versions of all C compilers and make sure the code we generate is portable and works well across them. And that's a lot of work. So in this way, we can reduce the number of backend compilers we're worried about. And I'll call out the last uh, bullet here as well. We wanted to target GPUs for some time, and LLVM provides a very attractive path for doing that. Uh, so since that initial 125 release, in 126, we added support for LLVM 12 and 13 as well. And in this month's support, uh, sorry, in this month's release, we'll be adding support for LLVM 14. All right, moving on to one of my favorite things, and one of the things I could probably talk to you for the whole half hour about. Uh, if you're familiar with the computer language benchmarks game, we've had some good progress here. If you're not familiar with it, it's a site that compares about 25 languages with about 10 benchmarks. And what we do with that is plot for each of the languages the geometric mean of its fastest code and its most compact code. So what this graph is showing you is for each of these languages that I've called out here, how small are its codes relative to other languages, which is to the left, the further to the left, the smaller you are. And the further you are down, the faster you are. And so as you can see, uh, well, I'd say we would argue that sort of down and to the left is kind of productive. And this is where we were about a year ago. And as you can see, um, Julia and Chapel rep, uh, take up kind of an interesting, unique space here, kind of down and to the left. Uh, I should note that all of these benchmarks are just desktop benchmarks. Um, some of them are parallel, some are not. Um, so this doesn't really show off the, the greatest strengths of Chapel, but it's still kind of interesting as a point of comparison. So again, this is where we were last year. And if you sort of let your eyes glaze and burn this into your retina, I'm gonna to advance to this year. And what you're gonna see is most of these languages are gonna take a jump up. They have gotten slower overall, uh, other than C, um, but Chapel actually takes a jump down. And so you can see that here. And I'll kind of pop back and forth between these as I speak, if I can manage it. Um, what happened here was a couple things. One is that the LLVM backend, when we enabled that, that benefited some of our performance. The other one is that we uh, submitted some new versions of some of the benchmarks that made us more competitive with versions in other languages, particularly C. Uh, so that's been a nice improvement in our standings in that site this year. All right, next I'm gonna to turn to 
highlights and changes in the language and library. Um, this is a section, again, that it could easily take up a half hour itself. I'm just going to call out a few of the more interesting things. In terms of language features, we've introduced a new manage statement, which provides context management like you might be familiar with in Python. And then we've used this to support resizing arrays of non-millable classes, which has been a real challenge for us because those arrays don't have a sensible default value when you resize them. We've introduced a new parallel loop form, the for each loop. And this is designed when you want to express that the loop is parallel, but you really only want to use kind of vector or GPU style parallelism. You don't actually want to spawn off new threads or tasks for it. And we've also introduced a new operator keyword for when you're introducing your own operator overloads. And this solves some rough corners in language we've been wrestling with previously. In terms of libraries, um, we've got a number of new library package modules. We've got a sockets module for doing sockets programming, a channels module for doing Go style channels between tasks, a copy aggregation module, which you may be familiar with from past talks. This is how we've gotten a lot of good performance out of Chapel, particularly for our CUDA in recent years, an arg parse uh, module, and then a concurrent map module. I want to call out that the first two modules here were developed as Google Summer of Code projects in 2021. And I want to call out uh, the contributors there. We really appreciate your work and also the mentors on these projects. And then there's also a third Google Summer of Code project that improved our linear algebra module by adding matrix exponentials. Um, that didn't make my previous slide, but I wanted to call it out here as well. So thanks very much to the Google Summer of Code students who contributed here, for Google for uh, supporting them, and for the mentors for guiding them through these projects. Uh, if you've been following the project for a while, you may be familiar with this concept of Chapel 2.0. This is something we've been talking about for the past several years. The idea is that we'll identify a forthcoming Chapel release. We'll call it 2.0. And the intent is for the core language and library features that will stop breaking those features going forward. So that if you're just using that core subset, uh, which is a pretty large subset, frankly, um, you don't have to keep rewriting your code with each release. Um, at this point, I think like last year, if I remember right, most of the language related changes have largely wound down. We still run into a few things, but they're increasingly sort of off in corners uh, for the most part. So most of our effort this past year has actually gone on stabilizing the standard libraries themselves. And by doing this, we're essentially reviewing them and looking at the names of routines, the names of arguments, the behavior, and making sure that things are the way we want to commit to them being. On this next slide, I'm showing uh, across the x-axis a list of all of the standard internal modules that we are looking at as part of this effort. And then you can see in each of the rows a time frame related to our Chapel releases. And uh, what you should be seeing over time is these going more and more green over time. So when the whole thing is green check marks, that means we've sort of locked in all of these modules the way we want them for this 2.0 release. And at that point, I expect we'll be ready to do the release. You can kind of tell from this, we're doing a breadth first uh, approach for the most part. So we're trying to get all of the modules reviewed at least once. And then uh, basically everyone on the team as part of their tasks is working on uh, resolving issues that we identify in those modules during the review. So again, this is getting more and more green over time and we'll see that continue over the next year or so. I wanna call out some user publications that have happened in the past year. It's always great when our users are publishing work about Chapel and, and talking about what Chapel has done to help them with their science. I'm gonna focus on two groups in particular. The first is the CHOP group at University of Luxembourg and in Rio Lille. Just in the past month or two, they've uh, published a couple of new papers. And so I've called those out here. Um, those are, there are links available to those from our website if you're interested in looking at those a bit. And then I also wanna call out the Chapel Ultra group at Yale University and University of Auckland. In April, they wrote a paper and then they've, uh, sorry, in September, they wrote a paper and then in April recently, they've revised it. Uh, that's available through archives, so you can grab that pretty easily. And then I want to call out that uh, Dr. Luna Zagarak uh, defended her PhD thesis this April, uh, which uh, was based on using Chapel as well. And I'm really happy that we'll be hearing a talk from Luna about her work uh, just a little bit later this morning. Um, next, I want to turn to our CUDA. If you're not familiar with our CUDA, uh, essentially what it is is a Python library. And so you as a user are writing Python code, you're doing that in Jupyter potentially, and you're making what look like more or less normal NumPy and Pandas calls. But where most high performance Python libraries are written in C say, uh, Arcuda is written in Chapel. And so under the covers what's happening is that Python library is talking to a server running on potentially a supercomputer or maybe just your laptop that is executing those commands for you and maintaining the state of your large arrays. Um, so this is the basic structure of our CUDA. Um, 
Some of the key features is that it is scalable, so it supports massive scale data, where in practice, this is often run on terabyte sized arrays. Um, it runs in interactive rates, which is really important in data science. So uh, most operations complete in seconds to minutes, despite the very large data sizes. It's extensible, so you can go in and add new operations and capabilities yourself. And it's fast and scalable. Um, I've got a graph, or sorry, a chart here, uh, maybe a little overwhelming, but just to walk you through it really quickly, in the rows, we've got operations. In the columns, we have uh, uh, NumPy itself in the first column, and then serial chapel in the second column, which you can see is you know, more or less on par with NumPy. And then the next, we have sort of shared memory chapel. So running that same problem size, but using all the cores on the node, you can see we can get speed ups from 3x to like 16 or 17x. And then the last column is running on a massive uh, 18,000 core run using a much, much larger problem size. And here you see speed ups of hundreds to thousands of times, where again, we're not only scaling the hardware resources, but also the problem size there. So if you are interested in doing NumPy and Pandas types of operations at these super massive scales interactively, you should take a look at Arcuda. And happily, it is an open source project. And I've got the link here so you can download it and use it yourself. Now, Arcuda has done an amazing amount of things since last year, and I can't go through all of them. Uh, I just don't have enough time. But just to call out the first few here, they've uh, really improved their support for data frames, including support for additional types uh, that you might expect when you're using a data frame. Uh, we also have now modular builds, where if you have some capability that isn't part of the main Arcuda source code, you can just add that in, or you can take other capabilities out if you want to reduce your build time or have a smaller, leaner server. Um, so that's been really great for uh, teams to create their own modules and sort of incorporate them or not as they wish, and either keep them private or make those open source as well. A couple of other things I'll call out here we'll hear about later in talks today. Um, the team at New Jersey Institute of Technology is going to be talking about some of the work they've been doing with graph capabilities in Arcuda. And then on our team, Ben McDonald has added support for par Parquet File I.O., and he'll be talking about that this afternoon as well. Uh, this just barely touched on what's been done. The Arcuda team has been growing by leaps and bounds. And I've got a link here to their release notes where you can read about lots, lots of more detail that's been added. One other thing that's really important from the past year is that Arcuda has undergone some pretty significant performance improvements, particularly on InfiniBand-based systems. And so on this next slide, I'm going to show a result we gathered last summer. So we had access to this massive uh, Apollo system, HP Apollo system, that had you know, over 73,000 uh, cores of AMD Rome. And so we decided to run the largest sort we could on that. And at that time, we sorted 72 terabytes of eight byte values. And that completed in two and a half minutes. So again, reasonably interactive, achieving 480 gigabytes per second. And perhaps most interesting of all, this Arcuda sort was originally ported from Nestle and is a fairly straightforward expression of a sort. It's about 100 lines of chapel code. Now, I'm not a sort expert, but what I'm told is that this is pretty close to world record performance for sorting. And I would guess that for performance per lines of code, uh, it almost certainly is a world record. Since this time, we've actually done additional improvements to the sort. We could probably run up to 100 terabytes on the system now and achieve 500 gigabytes per second. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have access to the system ourselves anymore. Uh, so we're going to have to wait for the next biggest system to come along to update this graph. So speaking of performance, um, another thing I could spend the whole half hour on. In the past year, there have been many, many performance improvements made to Chapel. Um, many of these have been motivated by targeting new platforms. I mentioned InfiniBand based systems, also high core count chips like the AMD Rome mentioned on the previous slide, and then nodes with larger memories than we've run on before. Um, in addition, user codes are always providing uh, good motivators for us to improve performance as well when users run into bottlenecks, and there are things we could do to improve their code or improve it for you know, general users. So the next two things are maybe the things I'm most excited about uh, in this year's talk. The first one is Chapel on GPUs, which is an effort being done by our team at HPE. Uh, so as background, if you're paying attention, you may have noticed that GPUs are becoming more and more of a key feature on many large scale HPC systems, such as Frontier, which just took the number one slot in the top 500 uh, last week or two. Now, as you heard me say today, we often talk about Chapel being about any parallel algorithm on any parallel hardware. But unfortunately, historically, the only way you've been able to use Chapel with GPUs has been through interoperability. So for example, you would write your GPU code in something typical like CUDA or OpenCL or OpenMP, and then you just call out to it from Chapel like any other external routine. And that works, 
But you know, wouldn't it be better, given Chapel's productivity features and things, to just target GPUs directly from Chapel? Uh, before I go on, I want to call out that Akihiro uh, from Georgia Tech and uh, his team there have been really leading the charge on this effort of doing good GPU support by leveraging this interoperability. And so we'll be hearing more about some of the work that they've done recently later on this afternoon. Meanwhile, what our team has been working on is making Chapel target GPUs directly. And there's been a huge amount of progress here since last year. So if we go back in time, last year in the 124 release, we actually could target GPUs, but it was using very low level, not really designed for user facing kinds of features and still a tiny bit of interoperability here on the right-hand side. So for the first time we were writing pure Chapel codes, if you will, they were targeting GPUs but not anything we'd really want users to write. And in fact, I don't even think we really advertised this that much uh, because we didn't want people really using it that much. But happily, in the 125 release, we raised the level significantly here. So that same computation could be written more or less as you see here. Um, and this is fairly simple, fairly straightforward, but it's also very traditional chapel. We use an on clause to say to run on the GPU and then a for all loop for the parallel computation. Um, so at that time, we could only do relatively simple computations only a single GPU and only on a single node. So it was very restricted. Now in the most recent release, Chapel 126, we improved the generality significantly. Lots more computational styles were supported. You could use multiple GPUs on a node uh, and you could do parallelism across both the CPU and the GPU simultaneously. So in this example, we're basically doing a very simple uh, array increment. But what's cool is we're driving all of the CPUs with this first statement and then all of the GPUs with this coforall statement uh, and on clause. So again, we're using just normal chapel concepts for composing parallelism and talking about locality and using those to drive all of the CPUs and GPUs. But again, at this time frame, only on a single node. So if we look forward, Chapel 127, I said, is coming out the end of this month. We now have support to target GPUs on multiple locales. Uh, so you get the full distributed memory support you're expecting from Chapel plus GPUs on each of those nodes. We've improved the representation of the GPU sublocales, and we have added support for more general computations. And we'll be hearing more about this effort from Engen a little bit later on this afternoon. Uh, looking forward, some of the things ahead of us, we need to do more benchmarking, performance analysis, and optimization. Our performance still isn't competitive with traditional techniques. We need more portability across vendors. So today we're really only worrying about NVIDIA, but we really want to make this uh, cross vendor uh, support. And we need to continue uh, generalizing the kinds of computations you can do on GPUs. So again, this is one of the efforts I'm really most excited about these days, and I'm proud of the team. Uh, that's been doing this. And then turning to users, um, I wanna call out the Champs team. Uh, this is sort of, for me, kind of the number one thing of the year. I think the Champs team's just been crushing it this year. Um, if you're not familiar with Champs, it's a 3D unstructured CFD framework for airplane simulation. It's currently about 100,000 lines of chapel that were written from scratch in about three years. It's been done by Eric Lorendo's students and postdocs at Polytechnique Montreal. And the reasons they chose Chapel are the kinds of reasons we usually talk about, performance, scalability, and productivity. Now, if you weren't here last year, Eric gave a really, really great keynote about their efforts and why Chapel matters to them. And uh, I've got a link here at the bottom to the talk. Um, if you haven't seen the talk and you're curious about Chapel, I really recommend going to hear about it from a user's perspective. Uh, it remains one of my favorite Chapel talks. Since then, the Champs team has just been out in the community like crazy. So Eric's actually been on sabbatical this year and he's presented Champs in Chapel at the University of Strasbourg and Ornera. Um, students have given presentations at various venues, both uh, society conferences and um, uh, sort of CFD society meetings. And then the team has been participating in these workshops which are highly interactive, like let's all work on a challenge problem together types of workshops. So they go in with the results, both performance and the sort of numerical results or simulation results. And what they're finding is despite being a relatively new project and a new code base, they're generating comparable results to much more high profile and longer lived sites like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, NASA, JAXA, Georgia Tech, and on and on. So this is uh, you know, a big part of how they've been crushing it this year. Um, the code they've written has more than doubled in size since the keynote last year. So they had about 50,000 lines at that time. They've got about 100,000, maybe even 120,000 lines now. And this growth, this sort of doubling in code has been the work of basically seven students and postdocs. Um, since last year, they released Champs 2.0 with many new features and capabilities. And we'll have a talk from Frederic from the Champs team later on, uh, actually very shortly, uh, that'll talk about um, some of those new uh, things that they've been doing. 
Um, so coming up, uh, they've got six to seven presentations at their big industry exposition this summer. That's at the end of this month. Eric's continuing a sabbatical tour. He'll be talking in Germany. And uh, they've got another workshop they'll be participating in a bit later this year. All right, last thing I wanna to touch on here is outreach. Um, I wanted to call out uh, PA ATM 2021. This is a workshop about alternatives to MPI like Chapel. So, and it's held at supercomputing. So last year, Thomas Rollinger published and presented a paper um, and happily we'll be hearing from Thomas later on today. So you get to hear a little bit about the work that he's been doing. We also had a couple of our PIs participate in a panel there and we really appreciate them uh, going out and representing Chapel at SC for us. Um, Michelle organized a really great mini symposium at SIAM PP22 this year that also featured the PIs of three of our projects, talking about their experiences with Chapel and how it's benefited them and the kinds of results they're getting from it. Um, the, we don't have the videos for these currently, but we're hoping to get them online in the next month or so. And again, another opportunity to hear in a short talk format from users what they're doing with Chapel. Um, there's been a lot more outreach this year than I could summarize here. I've got a link at the bottom. You can check through the slides and in this virtual world, world we're living in, many of them have videos as well. So you can catch up on things that you might've missed this past year. And with that, let me wrap up by talking about what's next. For our team, one of the big things we've been working on very quietly for the past several years, but we can now talk about a bit more, is tuning Chapel for the HPE Cray EX supercomputers and particularly the slingshot and interconnect that drives them. Uh, so we mentioned Frontier a few slides ago. Chapel does run on Frontier and other Cray EX systems and we're achieving promising initial performance, but there's definitely still additional tuning that remains given how new those platforms are. So again, that's something that we've been working on quietly. We'll be making more noise about it now that we're making more noise about the platform in general. And you'll start to see some of those results come out into the public very soon. We'll continue targeting our three main efforts that we've talked about, targeting GPUs, the Dino compiler rework, and the Chapel 2.0 stabilization. And we're also gonna continue working on growing the community. So supporting our existing users and identifying new ones. Um, this year, we're gonna do a working group for advent of code and sort of have a bunch of people coding Chapel together uh, to generate some more interest in the language. And we're hoping to launch a Chapel blog before we see you again next year, hopefully this calendar year. I mentioned PA ATM at Supercomputing earlier. I wanted to mention that the deadline for their submissions is coming up at the end of next month. So if you're doing applications work in Chapel or another alternative to MPI plus X, I really encourage you to submit your work to this workshop. It's a really great workshop. They support papers, talks, and this year they've added a new picture or video track. Um, so if you've got work you wanna highlight, it's a great place to do it. And with that, I wanna wrap up with what I consider the tweet of the year. Um, you know, you work along, you wonder if anyone's paying attention to you, you wonder if anyone cares sometimes, and then a tweet like this will drop out of nowhere. Um, so I'm just going to put this up and leave it up and let you read it. Thanks very much for attending, Chu, and that's my wrap up of the state of the project. I haven't really left time for questions, which um, unfortunately has been kind of the tradition for this talk, but I'll mention that I'll stick around during the first break and of course all day and would be happy to take questions during the breaks or over chat if that's more convenient. So that's my talk. And again, thanks very much for attending Chu. So Brad, this is Sherrod. I have a question for you actually, going sure back thing. to the keynote, the earlier introduction you gave. Uh -huh. You said we were moving to LLVM and you were maintaining the C backend as a portability option for previous work. Do you think somewhere along the line, we will be deprecating the C backend and just using LLVM straight? That's a good question. Um, there's definitely been, we've asked that on the team as well, uh, particularly since it would reduce the amount of code we were responsible for maintaining. I would say that if that were to happen, I would expect it would not happen for several years from now. And only once we felt like the C backend was not providing any value at all. I think that today we still find a lot of value in the C backend um, as developers. It particularly as we're all learning LLVM and LLVM IR, it's often for most of us, one of the easiest ways to understand pretty quickly the kind of code we're generating. And the code that we generate with the C backend versus the LLVM backend is for the most part, pretty isomorphic. So if you're seeing a bug with the LLVM backend, for example, you can often debug it in the C backend and take the result over. Okay. In addition, the C backend has some benefits to us at times in terms of, um, like debuggability of the generated C code, which, you know, again, most of us are more familiar with debugging so far, um, maybe using other tools that are compatible with C, things like that. So it's those kinds of things that make me say, I think it will be a long time before we retire it, if ever. 
And in fact, some of our users are still relying on the C backend as well for various reasons. Um, I will say that I think, you know, it may sound like I said one of the reasons of switching to LVM was to reduce our sort of maintenance costs, uh, portability across compilers. And so it may sound like, if, well, if we're keeping the C backend alive, have we really saved anything there? And I think the main thing is, you know, previously, if any user with any version of any C compiler reported a problem with that C compiler, like a portability issue or some, some bug in that compiler we had to work around, we would sort of feel it was necessary for us to do something about that. And I think today, if that kind of thing came up, if the user said, I'm using GCC 4.8 and I'm running into this issue and da da da, da I think we would say, you know, the C backend isn't really the preferred backend and, and we may opt not to fix that anymore if we didn't think it was important and off the beaten path. So I think there is still a savings to us in terms of development investment um, by sort of focusing on LLVM as the primary backend. But again, we still see a lot of benefits from the C backend. So I think we'll maintain it for quite some time, if not forever. Thanks. Uh-huh.